man. Oh, man. Didn't even think about this. That's perfect for the message we're about to get into today. So no coincidences this morning. Do y'all feel like we've, we've, we've just tasted, maybe caught a glimpse of what glory is going to be like when we get there this morning? If you haven't this morning, might need to check your faith because I'm sweating like a hog already this morning and I've just got the fire in my bones and my goodness, ready to roll. Anyways, y'all ready? I, uh, I don't really know how to start this thing, so I'm going to try and tell a story. Hopefully, I don't ruin it. Um, so, you know, we've been talking about the glory of God for a couple weeks now, and part three is today. I'm excited. Um, so, I guess the way I'm going to intro this message is after part one, a couple weeks ago, the next day, um, a dear, dear Jesus-loving sister in the church, she... Uh, she came to me, she was like, um, Joe, I got to tell you this story. She said, I was, after, after your message Sunday, talking about the glory of God, she said, I was driving into work the next morning, and the sun was coming up, and this beautiful sunrise. And she said, I got to thinking about scripture, and I was worshiping, and she probably had a praise music blaring. Um, um, she was beholding this beauty, just the sunrise, and beholding the glory of the Lord. So she's driving, and she said, she just started Weeping, just, you know, that kind of probably nasty type weeping, snotting and weeping and just, man, just worshiping, driving down the road, worshiping the glory of the Lord and the expanse in front of her. And then there comes this point where she, she, she looks over right out her window and there's a cow pasture and there's a, there's a cow literally right here, not too far from her car, the cow pasture right here. So as she's snotting and crying and looking at the glory of God out ahead in this beautiful sunrise, she looks over, and the next thing she beholds is that tail on the cow coming up <laughs> and the glory falling out. So, Lord, I just, uh, for church, I just want to tell you that the heavens declare his glory, and the earth is full of it. So that's how we're going to start this message. Please don't run out of here. I, I mean that as reverently as I possibly can. The Lord's the one who, who, who created all this, so don't think I'm trying to blaspheme something of me here. All right. Here we go. I'm glad y'all left because I thought I might, might ruin that story. So it's an honor, absolute privilege to be back in the pulpit once again this morning to deliver part three. I had no clue there was going to be a part three to this thing, but man, the Lord just keeps downloading, and it's a privilege. And I hope you realize that you being here this morning, like physically able to walk through these doors, sit in these chairs and be here is a blessing. It's a huge blessing. Our hearts are beating. Uh, your lungs are breathing. There's fresh mercies from the throne room on our lives today. There are many folks, uh, part of this body, a part of this church, somehow connected with this church who, who can't be here this morning. There's, there's folks literally suffering in hospital beds this morning who are a part of this body who would long to be here. There's elderly folks whose bodies are breaking down, who long to be in fellowship, long to be here in corporate worship, and they, they just can't be here. So it's a, it's a huge blessing. Please don't take this time for granted to come in here with brothers and sisters and get your praise on to hear the word of the Lord preached and taught. Let's pray. Father, here we are. We're gathered in the mighty name of King Jesus under one roof, and I'm sure there are some watching online. And I just pray your blessing on your people today. I pray as your word comes forth, Lord, may this not come in Joe power. May this come in Holy Spirit power off of my lips this morning. May Joe die on this stage and may King Jesus take his rightful throne. And Lord, may this message, which is your message, be delivered from your heart to your people with your authority, by your spirit, and for your glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we've spent the last couple of weeks beholding the glory of God. Week one, we beheld his glory in the Old Testament. Moses pleaded with God in Exodus 33, Lord, please show me your glory. And God allowed Moses to catch a brief glimpse 
of his glory. And what Moses beheld as the glory of God passed in front of him, what he beheld was all of God's goodness, his compassion, his mercies, his long-suffering, his abounding faithfulness and truth, his forgiveness of sin. And last but definitely not least, it's God's refusal to overlook sin and excuse the guilty. That was week one. If you miss these, you may want to go back and watch these because where we're going today, just to help you catch up. But last week, part two, we caught a glimpse of his glory in the New Testament. And it was revealed right from the get-go um, um, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the radiance of God's glory. He is the face of glory. We saw by way of a rapid tour through the New Testament that everything about Jesus was and is and ever will be glorious. His birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and his return, it's all glorious. Jesus' sole purpose in his ministry here on earth was to bring glory to his Father. We read in Philippians 2 that God the Father was glorified in his Son by way of Jesus emptying himself. Emptying himself of self. The kingdom was advanced and God was glorified when Jesus did that. And now Jesus has given us this mantle of glory so we can now empty ourselves of self, become living sacrifices so the kingdom can be advanced and God be glorified. Then we finish last week by reading 2 Corinthians 4, which tells us that you and I are not a big deal, like whatsoever, but we contain the greatest treasure. This treasure is the light of the glorious gospel, which shines in our dark hearts so we can have the greatest privilege of knowing the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. And in that 2 Corinthians, it goes on to say, through suffering, we will continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus will become evident and made manifest in our lives. And when Jesus Christ is seen in and through our lives, God Almighty is glorified. So it's been, uh, it's just been a privilege. It's been absolutely incredible to be a firsthand witness to the Spirit of God piecing these messages together week by week. Had no idea where we were going, had no idea there would be a part three, but he is so faithful. And the more I get to know him, please hear this, church, because I hope this encourages you. The more I get to know him, as I continue following him day by day through the daily grind, the more real he becomes and the more confident my soul becomes in giving his spirit total freedom and complete access to overtake, possess, and dominate my life. I promise you I'm not just a little sleazy preacher man or some young punk pastor who tells you God is good all the while living a fake life just to collect a paycheck from this organization we call a church. No, no, I tell you God is good and I encourage you with every fiber of faith in my being to get to know him and trust him because I have firsthand tasted and seen and experienced the glory of God Almighty to the point that I can honestly say I can honestly say that nothing compares to knowing the very one who knitted me together while I was still in my mama's womb. Following Jesus and suffering, sharing in his death is worth it. It's worth it. So as we dive into part three, please be encouraged. Oh, child of God, lift your head this morning. I know the last couple weeks have been somewhat intense. I mean, daggone, we're talking about the glory of God. His glory is intense. If, you, if, it ain't, if, if it doesn't feel intense by a preacher man preaching on his glory, we probably ain't preaching about his glory. It's intense. He can't help it. It's who he is. And I'm glad that my father is that kind of father. I'm sure there's been some soul searching, maybe some faith examination going on. I've definitely sensed 
a, a sober, a humble, a lowly atmosphere in the room as we've been beholding his glory in scripture. But there's also been a richness, a sweetness. There's this deep joy that I sense as well, even through conversations post-message. And that's a good thing. For the glory of God to be revealed in our lives, we must become nothing. And right there, what I just said is the ABCs. It's the one, two, threes. It's the foundation of this whole thing called being a disciple of Jesus Christ. We must get this to press on and go from glory to glory. So praise God if you have felt lowly and humble and sober and contrite. Maybe you feel like you're not measuring up. If you're feeling anything like that, don't you be discouraged. Don't you be disheartened. No, no, no. You take heart, O child of God, because Isaiah 57 says, For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in the high and holy place, but also with the broken and humble in order to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the hearts of the broken ones. I love how the NLT reads. It says, I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the courage of those with repentant hearts. But this past week as I've been preparing for this message, <laughs> we're getting ready to dive in. I just want you to know from the start, this is what I sensed for some reason, I'm his messenger this week. This is what I sensed from the Holy Spirit himself, the great encourager himself, the great comforter himself. Literally, what he was bearing witness in my spirit is that the church needs to be encouraged this morning. And y'all, it's just, <laughs> I sense a joy in the house. I think y'all have already been encouraged. So I'm just praying that as his word comes, may it encourage and bless you even more. So in our closing last week, we read the final verses of 2 Corinthians 4, which read, Therefore we do not lose heart. Though our outward man is decaying, our inward man is renewed day by day. For our trouble, light and momentary, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. As we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Yeah. I want to show you this verse in the complete Jewish Bible. It just... Same verse, but a little different wording here. For our light and transient troubles are achieving for us an everlasting glory whose weight is beyond description. So what is this eternal weight of glory being produced for us? I'm going to encourage you with this, that it's impossible to give you a simple little satisfying answer of what this eternal weight of glory is because it's beyond description. If you read on in verse 18, it cannot be seen with natural eyes, so I can't describe it to you with natural words because that which is natural is temporary, and we're talking about eternal matters which cannot be seen with natural eyes but can only be seen dimly and somewhat understood in the here and now with spiritual eyes. Of faith. And this is why the fleshly, carnal, natural old man must die daily, and the Spirit of God must come in and dominate your entire being. He ain't gonna kick your door down, no, you gotta let him in. And please know that this holy, glorious, jealous, all consuming God, he will not share a house with another God. He'll let that God just take you if you want that. But man, if you'll let him have his way, let the Holy Spirit dominate you. Your temple must be clean. You must be emptying yourself of self and giving the Spirit of God complete access. Let's go to Romans 5. 
Romans 5. I'm going to say the end of this message as I was putting it together and the Holy Spirit was revealing stuff to me is super encouraging. But we do have to trek through some stuff this morning that may be a little difficult to hear. Just want to give you that uh, heads up. But it's for his glory. And remember, it's for our good. Romans 5 says, therefore, having been, we're in verse 1, therefore, having been made righteous by trusting, we have shalom, peace, wholeness, completeness with God through our Lord Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Through him, we also have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we boast in the hope of God's glory. And not only that, not only that, but we also boast in suffering. Say, what? <laughs> Knowing that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Ruach HaKodesh, which is the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This is a passage you need to cling to with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Because if you're in Christ, if you're a child of the Most High, if you have put your trust in the all-atoning, bloody sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, then you've been made righteous. I don't think the church understands what that means. I don't mean just here. I'm talking about We've been made righteous. We've been justified. Justified means that we are holy and blameless and righteous. I don't know about y'all. I'm a knucklehead. I'm a low-down, dirty, rotten, wretched sinner. I didn't really know what words were about to come out there, but I'm glad I didn't cuss or something. But that's what we are. But by his blood, we're justified. You're righteous if you're a child of his. You've been made like Christ. What, the, what does that even mean? And not only that, you're at peace. You're at shalom, everlasting peace with the very God of glory. Never to face his wrath. No, no, you got shalom with the almighty God if you are his child. So grace and peace to you, O oh child of God. Be encouraged this morning. You are now a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Who cares about your citizenship here on earth? Who cares? Do you understand the glory we are heading for? Now, oh, the Lord's having me say stuff today that I really didn't want to say. I'm just going to forewarn you. I'm not apologizing for what I'm going to say because I say it with the confidence and the authority of God Almighty. And I know I'm speaking to a congregation. We got a lot of warriors in this room. I'll put it that way. We got a lot of folks in this room that I ain't going to pick a fight with you. No, no, no. Because you could pick your nose hair and cut me in half somehow. But we got a, we got a church full of proud patriots, and I'm talking about military, first responders, I'm talking about teachers and medical personnel, and all y'all I know are proud patriots in this room, but we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, so anyways, I give that as a foretaste so y'all don't pick me off while I'm up here this morning, because there are some beautiful truths if we can grasp them, I'm a proud citizen of the USA. I love my country. I would not want to be a citizen, not nowhere else in this world. And it is so terrible, it is so, so sad, and absolutely heartbreaking to watch the spirit of Antichrist take over our nation. But he must take over our nation so the Antichrist can rise, so our Messiah can come back, so we can get to our home that we're bound for. <laughs> and 
And, and when this happens, oh, you take heart, church, and you get ready for the fireworks show. Because when our Messiah returns in all of his glory, he will annihilate the enemy. That's what the word says. I'm not trying to dramatize anything. That's what the word of God says. So although it's heartbreaking in the flesh to watch out what to, to watch what's happening in the natural, no, no, you be encouraged in the spiritual. Because as a citizen of heaven, we've, we've got to look past the temporary. Because there's something coming. There is something coming. So, church, you've gained access by faith into his grace. So now you can stand and boast. You can be loud and proud. You can roll up in this worship gathering right here at NCF and not hold back. You can shout. You can holler. You can clap. You can sing. Not just because they're trying to put a performance. No, no. There ain't no entertainment. They're trying to lead us in praise and take us to the throne room. I mean, dang, oh, I ain't gonna say that. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Holy Spirit said, whoop. Mm. Here we go, Romans 5. It don't stop there. It also says that while we're still walking this sin ridden earth, we can boast in suffering. When's the last time you boasted in your suffering? When I read that, I was thinking, I'm like, when's the last time I boasted in my suffering? I think never. <laughs> we probably turn into a bunch of rumblers and complainers at the hint of any little bit of suffering or discomfort. And I'm guilty right with you. Maybe we never had, maybe because we've never really had to suffer for the name of Jesus. Maybe a second possibility that's just as real. Maybe another possibility. Maybe you didn't know that suffering for Jesus was something to actually boast in. And that's okay because now we know we can repent and we can press on. And we can boast in our suffering now. All right, here we go. This is what the Lord gave me. I believe much of the American church. Here we go. American church. We're a part of this whole thing. <laughs> We've been clinging to an Americanized gospel including those of us who were striving to be true disciples of Jesus Christ. Maybe we've been clinging to somewhat of a prosperity, Americanized gospel without even knowing it. What I'm about to say may cut deep because it cut me and it may make some angry because something rose up within me this week as the Holy Spirit, but I had to humble myself. And before the patriot side of us all rises up in defense and protect mode, just breathe, humble yourself. I'm afraid that we, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, I'm afraid that we have allowed, allowed the constitution of this great land the Declaration of Independence of this great land, these founding incredible, incredible, incredible documents. I'm not downplaying nothing. These incredible documents that I do believe the hand of God was, was somehow, I don't know what that looks like, but the hand of God was there with these writers, with the men pinning these documents. But I almost believe that we have allowed some of these documents and, and so forth to trump the word of God. To, if they don't trump them, to at least be on the same playing field as the word of God. And I hope we can hear this humbly this morning. I'm not saying this as a hater. I'm saying this as, as a patriot, as a lover of this nation. But I've heard many times, even recently, I really haven't heard it much here, but just in the in the body of Christ, I've heard in different circles even recently that as believers we have these God-given inalienable rights as Americans for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I get it. I get it. I get it. I really do. Inalienable rights is I had to look it up, but um, 
is an educated way of saying that these rights can never be taken away from us. These rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness will, will kind of work in a, in a society where everyone worships the same God, where everyone holds to the Bible as the word of God. But these incredible freedoms, I mean these wonderful freedoms that we have in America, they do open the door and pave the way for anything and everything to eventually creep in. And because of the depravity of man, the utter sinful, wicked state of man's heart, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness means many, 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 many different things to many, 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 many different people. And to be absolutely honest with you, I can't find anywhere in the Bible where God commands us to pursue happiness. So because of these wonderful freedoms, <laughs> much has crept into America that I don't believe the founding fathers ever intended. Amen. But the doorway and the enemy knows how to use any nook and cranny. That's why there's so many issues in the very church of Christ today. Because he'll use anything. He'll use anything. I don't see in scripture any place where God commands us to pursue happiness, but over and over and over, I do see where he commands us to pursue holiness. And because the majority of America finds zero happiness in holiness, these founding documents of this great nation, which have served in an amazing and mighty, and I do believe in one way or another, a kingdom purpose, for almost 250 years thus far. By his grace, maybe they can hang on for a while longer. But we got to know that these documents will not stand eternally. Nowhere in scripture tells us that these documents will stand eternally. Earthly government, no matter how good and no matter how godly it may begin, the spirit of Antichrist will attack nonstop day and night, just to get things to start to break apart and crumble. And once they begin to crumble, he will continue to attack day and night, nonstop, until government is totally anti-Christ. And as government turns anti-Christ, all focus and attention will begin to turn on and attack that which is pro-Christ and Christ-like in society. And we see all through history the people of God suffering under the oppressive hand of antichrist government, enduring great hardship, enduring great persecution, sharing in Christ's death, suffering with him. And it's in these times in which the people of God, they get to know their God in the most real and intimate way. And they begin experiencing the very power that raised Christ from the dead. And I know, church, this may be hard to hear and it may be tough to stomach, but we must allow the Holy Spirit to renew our minds and reveal to us that suffering with Christ is a privilege. It's something to boast in. It's an honor because there is glory in the suffering. Because suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And the promise stands true in Romans 8, which says, those who suffer with him will also be glorified with him. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how all this is going to look. I'm just following my Lord day by day. And he keeps showing himself faithful day by day. And this is the very reason why the apostles in Acts 5 counted it a privilege to suffer for the Lord. This is why Paul in Philippians 1 said we've been given the privilege to suffer with our Lord. And this is the very reason why multitudes through the years have suffered for the name of Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Even suffering to the point of death. Because it truly is a privilege we can boast in. Let's go to 1 Peter 4 now. Let's go to 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4.
Verse 1. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. Man, that's encouraging. Let's skip ahead to verse 12. Loved ones, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal or the fiery trials taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Instead, rejoice insofar as you share in the sufferings of Messiah so that at the revelation of his glory, you may also rejoice and be glad. If you are insulted for the name of Messiah, you are fortunate for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. For let none of you suffer as a murderer or thief or evildoer or as a troublemaker. That means you can't go out there trying to stir up trouble on your own accord and say, <laughs> I will be glorified. No, no, no. no. It's, it's got to be suffering. It's got to be lowly, humble suffering like Christ. Because he goes on to say, but if anyone suffers for following Messiah, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. For the time has come for judgment to begin with the house of God. If judgment begins with us first, what will be the end of those who disobey the good news of God? Now, it's, if it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what shall become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will, let them trust their souls to a faithful creator while continuing to do good. It's worth it, church. It's worth it. It's worth it. It's worth it. Through the temporary eternal suffering, there's an eternal weight of glory being produced for us. We are bound for glory. Glory so amazing, so awesome, that we can't even begin to truly understand it because it's beyond description. It's incomparable to anything we've ever seen, tasted, heard, dreamed, or imagined. And we got to accept this by faith and maintain hope, the hope of glory. All right. Second half of this message. In John 14. Jesus' final words of teaching to his disciples before his death. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Because I'm going to prepare a place for you. And one day I'm going to come back. And I'm going to take you home so you can be with me for all eternity. This place of eternity that Jesus is preparing, this promise of eternity with him, it applies to those of us today as well who are in Christ. And I'd like to finish out this message by going to Revelation. Let's go to Revelation 21. We at the end of the book. I guess the proper way is books. We at the end. Revelation 21. says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth were wrong, had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, <laughs> Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. 
He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making all things new. And then he said to me, write this down. Thank that God. Write this down because what I'm telling you, it's trustworthy and it's true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I'll give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards and unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars. Their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. I got to hit that real quick before we get to our glory one day. In this passage, we get a peek. It's like a little sneak peek through the, through the curtains of eternity. And by way of these eight verses... <laughs> that we just read, I hope we can sense the weight and the importance in how we view and regard eternity. For those apart from Christ, the unredeemed, the unregenerate man, still trapped in his sin, scripture says their fate is the second death, which is the everlasting, eternal burning. It's damnation in the lake of fire. Goodness, you don't hear that too much anymore. Sadly, the fear of the Lord has been lost in much of we consider the modern day church. I don't believe it has here. I see warriors. I see remnant in this body. I, don't, I think we need to grow in our fear of the Lord, but I do see a fear of the Lord in this body. But sadly, because of the lack of the fear of the Lord and the lack of of teaching on these biblical eternal truths, this lake of fire has become a laughing stock and a place of absolute mockery in today's world. We glamorize hell, glamorize Satan, glamorize sin, glamorize the demonic realm. It, it's become this mainstream kind of praiseworthy thing that folks don't even blush about today. So I, everything in me, guard yourselves, church. Guard your children. Guard your home. Rise up, O oh holy warriors of the kingdom of God. And do not allow these satanic forces to have any influence in your sphere. But just as the lake of fire is real, it's a real eternal home. There's another eternal home coming. The current heaven and the current earth will pass away. And God in his glorious creative power will bring about a new heaven and a new earth. And coming out of this heaven, God Almighty will descend the new holy city, the new Jerusalem, which will come down to the new earth like a bride beautifully adorned for her husband. And this will be where the God of all glory will finally dwell with his people for all eternity. Amen. Amen. You don't have to clear and uh, cheer and clap and all that this morning, but I hope as that, is, as that is proclaimed from the word of God, I hope something sparks in you. Something is up with our faith if there's not this spark like, yes, one day I'm going to get to get out of this hell hole and I'm going to be in my heavenly home. Man. The Bible doesn't give us detail upon detail upon detail and give us all the answers we want. But it gives, it gives me just enough to make, it just makes me want to lick my lips. I want to get there. To start by talking about this eternal home, everything's going to be new. I'm sure everybody in this room likes newness. I think it's a part of human nature. We like new. My kiddos like new toys. We appreciate newness. 
But the newness I'm talking about is not some man-made new thing. These new things, they ain't going to have made in the USA tags on them. And my goodness, show ain't going to have made in China tags on them anymore. No, no, I'm talking about God made new things. If you're in Christ, you have already been made a new creation. And one day the promise stands that you will receive a brand spanking new body, a glorious body, which will have the ability to stand in the presence of the one we've been talking about for three weeks now. In our glorious bodies, we will inhabit a new heaven, a new earth, in the new Jerusalem, this new holy city prepared by the very hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that this glorious heavenly abode will be a place of no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness and disease. And when I was reading this and realizing this, I was thinking about Megan and I, we... We know of just in our little sphere of folks we know, whether it be here or other churches or in other states and so forth, we know of three young mamas right now. Young mamas who are married with young children in the home who are battling cancer. Cancer is wreaking havoc on their bodies. They're suffering. They're suffering with great pain. And I... Let, right now, let's pray for these three young mamas, and we're going to use them also to represent any others struggling with pain and suffering, whether that be physically, emotionally, mentally, whatever. Father, here we are in your presence, and we approach your throne, the very throne that the doorposts are shaking right now because of the praise of the seraphim. We approach you because you're the only one we got to come to. There's not another man, woman, child, animal, thing on this planet I can go to who can do anything about any one of our issues. And Lord, right now we lift these three young mamas up before your throne. And we pray with every bit of fire and unction and passion in our beings. Father, we pray that your healing hand come upon these mamas. And we also use these mamas to represent the greater body who are suffering in whatever kind of way, I pray that your holy, mighty, awesome hand of comfort and peace and strength come upon them. Give them the grace and the strength to endure this battle. And when you see fit, oh God, I pray your healing hand drop on them. And I pray your holy fire refine them, purify them. Just burn up any cancer cell that may be in their body. Burn it up, oh God, and may they be able to get back to their family in a healthy way and be mama bear the way they're supposed to. Amen. And your will be done. Your kingdom come. Jesus, awesome name. Amen. So church, take heart. Be encouraged. In heaven, doctors will no more have to give that dreaded news that you got cancer or you got five days to live. You got five years. No, no, no. Hey, Ain't gonna be no doctors. There's one doctor and everything's already cured. The great physician. We're just gonna sit there and worship him. Heaven will be cancer free. Hallelujah. There'll be no more depression, no more anxiety, no more loneliness, no more division, no more mental illness, no more sin and hurt and troubles and trials, no more suffering, no more persecution, no more crime, no more sickness and disease, no more terrorism, no more financial hardship, no more taxes, no more addiction, no more human trafficking, no more bad news, no more wars, no more death. If you ain't on the Jesus train bound for glory, let's make it happen today. I'm trying to, I'm not dramatizing the word. I'm just telling you what I know about heaven. The kingdom of heaven is a place of the most perfect perfection, the purest of purity, the most beautiful beauty, the most glorious glory, the holiest of holiness. And we must remember that while we endure this temporary earthly time of trials and tribulations and hardship and suffering, there's an eternal weight of glory being produced for us by our master, our Lord himself. Another thing, as I think about heaven, I can't help but think of all the children running the streets, laughing and playing, who never even received a name here on earth. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and you better not stop them. 
For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. I read this article. I'm not, I don't know much about this magazine, but an article from Christianity Daily. They ran an article this year in January, 2021, with the title, Abortion is the Leading Cause of Death Worldwide in 2020, Higher Than Cancer, Malaria, and Others Combined. Combined! The numbers in this article were staggering. They based it on an organization. Um, it's like an independent self-finance team that, and trust me, I ain't putting all my trust in an organization and the numbers they collect. But here's the numbers that this article ran. In their calculations, last year alone, 2020, there were 42,655,372 abortions worldwide. And that's all they could calculate. Let's get super liberal with the numbers. Let's say that they, they, they botched that whole article and only 25% of their numbers are true. That's still a ridiculous number. Think about all the babies sacrificed, murdered, aborted, or whatever term you want to put on the slaughter of babies since the beginning of time. They did this mess in Bible times as well. Think about all that baby blood that's been shed since the beginning of time. We're talking about astronomical numbers. On top of, um, on top of murdering babies, think about all the orphans worldwide who've died due to starvation and disease. Think about all the other babies and children killed due to wars and drug addiction and sex trafficking and on and on and on and on and on and on. And, on. and the point of today's message is, is not to not to talk about abortion and, and orphans dying and so forth. No, no, the point of scripture, or the point is that scripture is quite clear that Jesus is very pro-children. He loves children. I can't imagine the brokenness, the hurt, the anger, the vengeance, the wrath being stored up in the heart of God. He's holding his hand of wrath back. He's holding it back. I can't imagine that wrath being held back that's going to unleash on man. Because of man's most vile treatment towards the most innocent, the most pure, and the most vulnerable of our society. How can a man put a price tag on that which is priceless? How can a man mutilate and murder that which is fearfully and wonderfully made in the very image of God Almighty? Jesus has a special place in his heart for children. I believe that with everything in me. So much so that when folks brought their children to Jesus... For Jesus to lay hands and bless and pray over. In Matthew 19, he told his disciples, because his disciples were trying to kick people out of the way and say, get your kids away from Jesus. You ain't got time for all that. No, no, no. Jesus said, no, no, these right here who you're trying to discard, no, 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 get them over here. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them. I believe heaven will be swarming with children with the joy of young laughter, with the innocence of children playing. I believe there'll be a very youthful, childlike vibe in heaven. I don't know what all that looks like. But those who were absolute nobodies on this earth, those who were never given a name, those who were never allowed to take their first breath outside the womb, never known, throwaways, used and abused for laboratory experiments, used and abused to fulfill the wicked sexual desires of one man and fill the pockets of another man with cash. I believe these used and abused earthly nobodies will be some greatly blessed and highly favored heavenly somebodies. Heaven's going to be awesome, y'all. And I can't wait to get there. I want to continue reading in Revelation 21 about our heavenly home. But I want to skip ahead to verse 22. Go back and read the rest of this chapter. I'm trying to get somewhere today. Go back and read the rest of this chapter. Because John gives details um, as to what he saw in the spirit overlooking this heavenly city. He gives details as to the size of this city, the look of this city, what the walls and the gates and the foundation were made of, the materials that this city are made of. It's just beauty upon beauty when you read these verses. It's beauty upon beauty stacked in this heavenly city. Main Street in heaven, just a solid slab of gold. 
gold like we ain't seen. Not the gold that comes out of what them guys dig up in the show Gold Rush. No, no, no. We're talking about the purest of gold that we've never eaten. You got walls of jasper, foundation, the foundation of the walls uh, decorated with diamonds and sapphire and emerald and topaz and amethyst and on and on. I mean, come on, y'all. And that's just what John saw. He was probably just trying to put some earthly terms to things that... I love what Keith Green said, one of my favorite music artists, worship guys of all time. He said, I know that Jesus Christ has been preparing a home for me and for you for 2,000 years. And if this world took six days and that home took 2,000 years, hey, man, this is like living in a garbage can compared to what's going on up there. Revelation 21, 22. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb its light. There you go. I told you a couple weeks ago that, that compared to the glory of God, the sun is like child's play. In this city, the glory of God is the illumination. That's going to be awesome. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. My dear brothers and sisters, all I want to hear when I get there, I, it's just, I don't know if you call like Joe King or if there's like some heaven. I don't know how that works. I just want to hear my name called at the end of time. I want to hear my wife's name, my kid's name, my family's name. I want to hear your names called out. Let's keep rolling in Revelation 22. Verse 1. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life. Clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. Remember that main street of gold. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads, and there will be no night there. No need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Praise God, hallelujah, a million, a billion, a trillion times over. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. God Almighty. In my natural words, which I pray are backed by his authority and his spirit, I hope you're sensing just a weight, like a good weight of what our eternity looks like, what we are headed for. So I want to I want to show you a little snippet of a, of a video. We're getting ready to play it. This is a guy, um, he actually, this was in his message from last week. This is a guy who I've grown to uh, dearly love, greatly respect. Um, he's kind of become a, somewhat of a mentor in my life. Uh, his name is Rabbi Greg Hirschberg. Um, he pastors a congregation down in Macon, Georgia. Um, but at the end of his message last week, the Lord gave him in his time of preparation, like a, a, a prophetic word um, for his congregation. But when I heard it, I was like, no, that ain't just for your congregation. That's for the body. So can we go ahead and it's just a couple minutes. Last but not least, I want to tell you something the Lord told me. Hopefully it will encourage you. Things are not coming apart. They're actually coming together.
2020 was somewhat of a year of darkness, you remember? I said it was going to be a very dark year. I didn't know what the heck I was talking about. That was January. I had no idea what I was saying. 2020 was somewhat of a year of darkness where Satan flourished, or so he thought. Going forward, God is preparing the remnant to rise up once again. Satan is going to be miserably surprised. Yes, folks, the church is being deconstructed, no question, and disestablished and disenfranchised. But at the very same time, the remnant is being built up, rooted in, and soon to be empowered. As things get darker, the remnant shall get brighter. And God shall bestow gifting and power on us, the likes of which we have never, ever seen. Once again, the true body of Messiah shall rise up and once again become a force to be reckoned with. My humble advice is threefold. Stay very close to God in these days. Don't let things interfere. Don't serve other gods. Don't worship anything but the Lord. Stay very, very close to God. Put away all your idols, whatever they are. Just destroy them. And last but not least, if you really want to get close to God in these last days, ask God in your prayers for a burden for the lost. We have lost that burden. The church has become a lost church. She does not cry for the lost anymore. Maybe a relative, maybe a son and daughter. I've been praying that lately. I have a resurrected prayer about that for the lost. I do. I used to cry for them, being honest, all the time. And I kind of stopped. When I got into professional ministry and missions and doing all kinds of stuff, but I'm, I'm getting back that burden again. I'm starting to see people in the park with flames around them. I want to get back to that place. Because before you could be a winner of souls, you have to be a weeper of souls. We have fell prey to dry-eyed Christianity. We want the gifts, but not the giver. Yeshua had one mission. He came to seek and save the lost. And although I know they're not listening, keep, keep putting it out there because they're going to be listening very soon. Things are about to fall apart like never before. And they're going to see you standing and praising. And they're going to want to know what you have. You're not going to have to seek them. They'll be seeking you. church we got about an hour and a half left of material no I'm just kidding we're going to bring it to a close I don't really know how to close it but I, I did write something here the more I read about and meditate on this glory land that we're heading for the more I can't wait to get there heaven's going to be awesome but our current reality I almost feel like today I've almost almost stepped into glory, <laughs> but our current reality for the time being is to continue walking this sin-ridden wilderness here on earth with all of its trials, all of its troubles, all of its suffering, all of its persecution, all the while carrying the glory of our Messiah, representing his kingdom, allowing his glory, his beauty, his power, his love to radiate and shine through us so when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ one day, and I hope and pray there will be many others able to stand before the judgment seat, holy and blameless, give an entrance to the gates of glory for all eternity because there was a remnant, an army of kingdom warriors right here in Carthage, North Carolina at New Covenant Fellowship who determined and resolved in their hearts on April 25th, 2021 to follow King Jesus no matter what may come, no matter what hell or high water we may have to trek through. May many be able to enter 
this glory land with us one day because we took the word of God seriously, because we allowed the spirit of God to have lordship in our lives, and because by the grace of God Almighty, we endured and chose to be faithful to the king, to carry out and obey his will, his plans, his desires, and just as our master, our Lord, our Savior, determined in his heart that he would endure the suffering and glorify his Father by going to Calvary, may we determine in our hearts today, once and for all, to know our God and the power of his resurrection and to share in his suffering so that our Father may be glorified. And on that beautiful, glorious day in the future that hopefully comes sooner than later, may he receive the reward of his suffering, a pure, unadulterated bride bought and paid for by the very blood of his son. And together, we will march through those gates of glory. And finally, 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 we shall behold his face and we will worship him in the purest form for all eternity, declaring holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. That right there is the heart of a true disciple of Jesus Christ. And my only desire, and I'm not saying this because I'm paid to do it. No, I'm telling you what's in my heart. My only desire is that New Covenant Fellowship of Carthage, North Carolina, be known for and have a reputation that precedes itself in raising up true disciples and kingdom warriors who fear nothing but God and hate nothing but sin, wreaking havoc on the gates of hell, forcefully advancing the kingdom of God with a holy violence which cannot be stopped. On that note, let's stand, you bunch of holy warriors. Let's stand. I just want to pray once again a blessing over you. As I'm putting this together, I'm just meditating. Man, I was getting so excited for glory. And I hope just something is sparking in you today. So, Father, here we are. We lay our lives down in your presence. Because the more I get to know you, Father, I'm just like, I don't even want Joe to even try to be Joe anymore. No, Joe got to die because I'm seeing the glory and the beauty and the power of my master. And I pray, oh God, that that revelation begins sparking and taking over and dominating our lives here at NCF. May this church here, <laughs> right here in small town, Carthage, North Carolina, may you spark something and set something ablaze in our hearts that not even the gates of hell, no scheme of the enemy even stands a chance with this remnant because we ain't buying into those lies. Give us the truth, oh God. Please reveal your truth. Reveal who you are more and more to our hearts so we can stand before you one day, holy, blameless, righteous, like a pure, unadulterated bride. And hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. You get on in these gates of glory. We're going to spend eternity together. Thank you for allowing us to be your children. And I pray, oh God, while there's still time, may many more become your children. Give us opportunity. And may we realize those opportunities when we can share your love with someone. We love you, Lord. We trust you. And we're going to keep on following you. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Y'all be blessed. Have a wonderful week.